to legume or not to legume? That is the question. Well, let's refine it a little bit and, to, and bring it down to a more modern debate, to soy or not to soy? That is the question. Now, the only way I can deal with this is by actually referring to the literature and to my own research that I did when I was at the university. Now, recently I attended a soy symposium in my own country because nutrition is a very important factor in the world today and with the financial implications of traditional diets in the Western world versus more simple diets in the traditional African setting, this became very important. And are they going to introduce soy products on a large scale? Yes or no? What about all the GMO issues in the world? And all of these things that come together with the package deal. And then there's the problem in the world today where the debate as to which protein is the best protein is still raging. Some claim to this very day that animal protein is superior to plant protein. And so I will just recap in a, in a different setting what has been said about these issues and, uh, well, what I have found in my own research and that of my students. So I'm going to look at traditional African diets versus westernized diets because traditional African diets are rich in legumes, grains, particularly maize, legume combinations, and lots of greenery and fruit. That is basically the diet. And of course, if you want to look at it from a biblical perspective, that seems to be the diet that originally was well, the diet of Eden. I give you every tree with fruit on it and every seed-bearing plant. So that would include the seeds, the grains, the nuts, the legumes, and all of those as part of a diet that should be the best for humankind. Now, some people say that, uh, well, plant foods won't supply sufficient protein. Is that really so, or is it not so? This is a typical African market, and uh, that's what they sell. Huge bags of legumes, any kind of legume you can imagine. And grains, and lentils, and kidney beans, and pinto beans, and all of these issues. And recently, of course, soy to a large extent. Now, it's interesting that GMO is not a problem in China because China forbids all GMO. There is no GMO in China. It doesn't exist. So the GMO that has been introduced into the Western world is mainly for cattle feed, and the GMO that is, well, exists is to give the plant an advantage in terms of herbicides so they can spray crops without the plants uh, being affected. And so it is an, what we call an add-on gene that prevents it from being destroyed when you spray uh, substances like Roundup, for example, that kill weeds and traditionally would also kill the, the bean, any broadleaf plant. And so if it has this gene, then, well, it's not affected. It doesn't really affect the nutritional side of the issue. It doesn't really affect the ratio of the protein to the carbohydrate to the fat, but it does add this so-called benefit. Now, my own personal view is that uh, whatever was there in nature is perfect, and the less we mess with it, the better. So this issue is, is, is an issue that will not go away because cross-pollination with GMO is always a likelihood and no matter what crop you have, you're going to get cross-pollination, but that cuts across the board. It's not just a, a legume issue or a soy issue, it's a grain issue as well, because this is being used all over the world, and we cannot guarantee that anything in this day and age is totally GMO-free. So under the circumstances, all you can do is the best you can and leave the consequences where they may be. And if you have faith, you can stop eating and wait to 
be buried. Or you could have faith and say, having done the best I can, I leave the consequences to God and I will eat what is best according to current understanding for my body. So when we're talking about grains and legumes in the traditional African diet, maize forms a very important component and all of these legumes. If you move to the Western idea, then wheat and uh, rye and all of these grains are important. If you go more to, into the Eastern cultures and African to a, some extent, then it's the rice grains that are important. And what are, what are these combinations actually doing? And is it so that we would get a good protein and sufficient protein from these food products? Now before I go there, let's just look at one interesting issue. And that is the condition of chronic diseases versus infectious diseases in various populations around the world. Now, if you look at the number of people with chronic conditions, then we can see that since 1995 they have been rapidly increasing. So chronic conditions such as heart disease, cancer, all of these issues are not going away. So the current knowledge of the Western world doesn't seem to be helping as far as these diseases are concerned. And an, a more informative graph would be uh, the growing global chronic disease epidemic by Cohn. And we see that Europe and Central Asia, now those are first world situations, they suffer from the most chronic diseases, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, all of these, these modern uh, phenomena. Whereas infectious diseases are pretty much under control because of medical facilities that are available, antibiotics that are available, all of those things which are readily available in westernized countries. When you go to the East Asia and the Pacific, the picture stays much the same, slight increase in, in sort of infectious diseases. But if you go to sub-Saharan Africa, where you don't have the infrastructure, where the medical facilities are not there, chronic diseases are actually less prevalent than are infectious diseases. So it depends on, on your environment. But as matters improve, in, well, automatically people start changing their diet to a more Western diet and then the chronic diseases again increase. So this is a very informative graph that the chronic diseases in the poorer nations where grain legumes seem to be the most important part of the diet, that they don't get those diseases. Diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease and other chronic conditions account for most deaths in, mid, in rich middle income and lower middle income countries, surpassing infectious diseases, malnutrition and deaths of new mothers and babies combined. In low income countries they account for 40% of deaths but are predicted to become the cause of more than half of all deaths. So it's increasing. Speaker at a recent symposium explained that chronic diseases are also a drain on national economies, so their spread will make it harder to win the global fight against poverty. The symposium held on so-and-so in Washington, D.C. tells us how important lifestyle is in the risk of chronic diseases. Everybody knows it's lifestyle. And everybody knows what the answer is and what kind of food we must take and what kind of protein we must eat and why is it increasing if everybody is so knowledgeable on the issue? Isn't that a rather interesting question? So if we look at world breast cancer, prostate cancer in the world, we find that it is the developed countries that suffer from the most breast cancer and prostate cancer. And as we go to the poorer sub-economic countries, well, then there's a massive decline in these diseases. So what's on your plate definitely makes a difference. And these are uh, not 
too young, but they ex explain an important issue which I haven't found in the modern literature of late. That there is also a difference on a racial divide. That seems to be unpopular to do that kind of research today. But for example, lung and bronchial diseases in white males versus the same in black males, there's a considerable difference. It's far more prevalent amongst uh, black people. Now some might say that has to do with socio-economic circumstances, but uh, it is also the case if you're looking at people in the same sort of bracket. So it has more than just that. Prostate gland problems and cancer is far less prevalent in whites than in black people. And uh, as well as all of the other chronic diseases, they seem to be more prevalent in black people than others. Now is this a genetic thing? The answer is no, it's probably not genetic, but uh, it's probably epigenetic. That means that which you are accustomed to will put an imprint on your genetic system to enable you to cope with whatever your diet is and any switch from that will become more prominent in the generations that uh, adopt the different diets and that can take a number of generations. Now even if we go back just a hundred years the chronic disease situation in, de in developed countries was far lower than it is today. So this is just talking about a few generations. When we look at animal proteins and lymph gland cancer, again we can see that the higher the consumption of animal protein, like in the USA, New Zealand, Denmark, Canada, Switzerland, uh, the greater the, the incidence of this kind of cancer. And as we go down to countries that consume more plant protein, well then the situation changes. When it comes to breast cancer, we have exactly the same thing. Thailand, Japan, that have uh, traditionally not have high animal protein consumption because soy protein, tofu, all of these issues are important in their diet. They are less likely to receive those diseases. When we come to milk and breast cancer, it's fascinating that the dairy countries are at the top of the hit parade and the non-dairy countries such as the African black people, Japan, Thailand, they have lower incidence. So what about soy? Is soy something that one should propagate or should not propagate? If you read the media, you would certainly want to stay away from soy because soy has not only all the GMO problems, totally ignoring the fact that the GMO problem is not just a soy problem but a universal problem uh, stretching across major food sources. So that is certainly not an issue. Corn is genetically modified, rice is genetically modified, Various legumes are gen genetically modified. So there are so many products that are genetically modified and to guarantee that something is GMO free is absolutely impossible. Absolutely impossible. Now we've done many tests in our country because we're trying to introduce there non-GMO edamame, which is the green soybean. And even when you do that, because there's so much uh, animal feed that is being produced, there is some cross-pollination, so you can never ever be free in the world that we are living in. You just have to do the best you can and uh, see where you go. So these are frozen, soaked ones. Are they any different to those that are not soaked? Answer is, even if you freeze them, you can still grow them. Because in nature, legumes also are in the ground, and it freezes over and it keeps them dormant and nothing happens to them because of the content of the, the fat content etc. And when, it, when the freeze stops, well then they germinate. So there is no loss of nutritional value in the legume. Now this is the edamame beam. It's a rich source of carbohydrate, protein, dietary fiber, omega fatty acids, 
Several vitamins, minerals, about 150 gram, five grams of prepared edamame contain approximately 16 grams of carbohydrate, 17 grams of protein, 8 grams of fat, and 8 grams of dietary fiber. Now some people say, you know, we really have to push up our protein consumption. So we should have high protein foods and avoid foods that are high in carbohydrates because, you know, that leads to obesity and all of these issues. And some of the modern diets are high protein diets. And do they lead to weight loss? Yes, they do. Are they the best diets to have? Absolutely not. Because they will lead to other problems. Increase acidosis, increase calcium loss, all kinds of problems. And then also, most importantly, increase inflammation. And inflammation is the one factor that leads to cardiovascular disease, cancer, and all of those issues. So, what kind of protein do we need? And is uh, the Bible wrong when it says that the original diet was rich in fruits and grains and nuts and seeds and legumes and vegetables were later added when circumstances required it. Is it wrong? Is it wrong to have a combination of a food where you have protein, fats, and carbohydrates in a certain ratio? Well, of course not. We need all three. And not only that, if you take natural foods, they're rich in fiber as well, which means that you will not have glucose surges because the fiber the soluble fiber holds on to glucose in the intestine, doesn't give you a glucose surge. The non-soluble fiber makes sure for motility through the intestine. So you don't have those chronic gut diseases that we have in the world today. And uh, that of course brings other questions as well, and things that get bad press in terms of protein in the plant kingdom, like the protein in, in grain products, particularly wheat, is what? Gluten. And uh, gluten has such bad press these days that uh, every single thing, they will tell you that golf balls are gluten-free these days. Uh, I'm joking, of course, but it says it on every single label. Something that shouldn't even come close to gluten is suddenly gluten-free. And it seems as that is a great virtue because of all the, the intestinal problems associated with gluten. It's interesting that uh, these stomach ailments and contractions and problems that you experience when you have these products often go away if you throw out the animal products. And uh, that's an interesting factor in itself. And I always think of my own experience when I was a huge carnivore. I could not consume apples, and many other fruits. They would give me heartburn until I thought I was going to go through the roof. So I never ate them. They were bad for me. They were bad for my health. Until I discovered, of course, that the meat that I was eating stayed in my stomach for six to seven hours and caused tremendous acid production. And if I put a fruit in that together with the meat, well, the fruit would want to pass through my stomach rather quickly, but it couldn't because of the meat, and so it fermented and gave me heartburn. So I threw out the baby with the bath water and threw the apple out instead of the meat. And the same, I think, applies to gluten. And we've had lots of experience with this. People that are gluten intolerant and cannot do this, yes, take it away get their diet normalized and put them on a proper diet and then eventually start introducing the grains and lo and behold, the problem doesn't exist until they go back to their bad habits and then all of a sudden these problems reoccur. So the question I have for all of these people that propagate all of these issues is where does the problem lie? Does it lie with the plant food or does it lie with the animal product? Of course, it's not only rich at Amami in the basic uh, important food components, but it's also rich in vitamins, lots of vitamin C, vitamin K, 
uh, thiamine, B2, B3, a whole list rich in zinc, magnesium. So it is a total food. And just because it is a soy product, should we eliminate it? We hear that it's rich in estrogens, because all soys are rich in estrogens. Well, soy doesn't contain estrogens, it contains phytoestrogens. And this is a typical, typical example of ignorance exploited by the media and by other interested parties to give that which is healthy a bad press. If we look at prostate cancer death rates, we see that the lowest prostate cancer rates, we find them in China, South Korea, Japan, and when we go to the UK, Australia, and the USA, well, there's a massive increase. So, what's the problem? Is it a genetic problem? Well, you cannot get a more, cult more cult multicultural society than the USA, for example, and yet, across all the racial divides, we have this massive increase. So it's, it's dietary related. And what is the problem? Well, in this case, I'm convinced that it is dairy related. Now, one of the key researchers in phytoestrogen research was a Nobel laureate, Dr. Kenneth Setchell, and he started this whole ball rolling regarding the phytochemicals that occur in plant foods. That's why it's called a phytochemical. It means it comes from plants. And one of the chemicals, of course, is phytoestrogen. So called because it has estrogenic effects, but not in the sense of feminization. We read in the press, because they pick up on this word estrogen, that uh, you will develop estrogen-related symptoms, such as breast development in boys. I have not read anywhere or seen anywhere in the, in the environment or, well, <laughs> in the world, that the Chinese, exa for example, that the boys all have to wear bras. I've never seen that in my life before. And neither does it cause feminization because it is the most populous nat a nation in the world in spite of their uh, control of births, which now have been lifted. So what is the real issue? And what is really happening here? So let's look at his research because he's called basically the father of this type of research. 20 years ago, he wrote, already in the 90s, Nobody had heard of phytoestrogen. What intrigued us in the late 70s was our discovery that if soy foods or linseeds are eaten, the concentration of phytoestrogen in blood soars. We then went to show that people who regularly eat these foods, like Asians, vegetarians, have huge levels of phytoestrogens in their body. And guess what? What does the modern media say about this? Bad news! Bad news! And uh, the health fraternity says, good news, good news. Now, who are you going to believe? The press? Or are you going to believe what some of these scientists did, even in the early 80s? These people do not suffer the ravages of the common diseases that kill Westerners. In two landmark scientific publications in the early 80s, we proposed that phytoestrogen offered a clue to healthy living. And the ben benefits were with regard to breast cancer, prostate cancer, heart disease, osteoporosis, menopausal symptoms, brain diseases with aging, alcoholism, uh, inflammatory diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis. All of these are protected again. And uh, the question, of course, immediately had to be answered, what is a phytoestrogen? And if people would understand the difference between an estrogen and a phytoestrogen, they wouldn't fall into this popular press uh, advocating the exact opposite effects of what they actually bring. Phytoestrogens are natural plant molecules similar in shape and size to the human body's estrogen. This is what they wrote early on in this research already. But not identical, and here's the key. 
This slight difference means they don't have all the same effects as estrogen, luckily, since some of the effects of estrogen can be nasty. Phytoestrogen inhibit the action of enzymes that cause tumor cells to multiply. Genistein is the most common one of these phytoestrogens, are found in soy, potently inhibits enzymes called protein tyrosine kinases that regulate the way many growth factors work in cells. The same enzymes are involved in inflammation. And today, as research has increased in this area, we know that inflammation is probably the root cause of all chronic diseases. That's where it starts. And most people in Western societies are, suffer from chronic inflammation, which can lead to cancer and all the other debilitating diseases. So inflammation plays a central role in many other conditions, heart disease, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, inflammatory bowel disease. You know, people were so puzzled with this kind of research because you would jump on the one bandwagon only to find off that you fall off the other bandwagon. For example, estrogen research and phytoestrogen research. Where do they lead us? Is it the same? Cholesterol. Cholesterol is bad for you. Yet everybody needs cholesterol. If you don't have cholesterol, you die. Every single cell has to have cholesterol built into its, its cell membrane or you die. No cholesterol, you're dead. So cholesterol can't be bad. The body produces its own cholesterol. So then they started finding out the ratio of high-density lipoprotein versus low-density lipoprotein. That's where the problem lies. But some people consume vast amounts of uh, cholesterol in eggs and other things and don't have any problems. They're very active. Many people, like uh, very active people, like loggers, for example, they don't develop these problems. So there's another aspect here, which is physical exercise. Some people eat the worst diets and don't have cholesterol problems, and some eat, people eat healthy diets and have cholesterol problems. So what is it? Is it really such a simple issue, or is it more complicated than that? Psoriasis, inflammatory bowel disease. Oh, that must be the protein that we find in wheat that's causing the problem. Then uh, my question is, why is it so prevalent in the world, even in areas where they don't eat wheat, when they change to Western-style lifestyles? Several studies have now found that phytoestrogen are anti-inflammatory and may therefore have a positive effect on such conditions. And this is what they came up with. They will protect you against all these diseases, the consequences of alcoholism, your IQ thinking patterns, brain health, also menopausal symptoms. They'll increase your blood vascular system, change the blood parameters inflammation, diabetes, all the cancers that are prevalent in the world. It's a protective factor. So what's the story now? Do we avoid it? Do we take it? What about plant proteins and animal proteins? Well, if you want to go to the high protein categories, well, then you have to switch to animal protein. So some people say, if you have these diseases, if you have this problem or that problem, well, then you must increase your protein intake. And the only way you can do that is by moving to some animal protein, preferably something like eggs. Now, eggs contain high concentrations of protein. And high concentrations of protein are designed for growth, rapid growth. Now, a creature that is confined within an egg shell has to produce out of the protein that is in the egg all the growth of the chick or the bird or the whatever that comes out of that egg. And protein, of course, when you metabolize it, produces toxins like, your, like uh, nitrogen toxins, which have to be detoxified. So can do that with uric acid, and then you don't have to have liquids associated with it. And then you can have rapid growth and the whole development of whatever has to develop in that egg. But once you have started, uh, once you are fully grown, do you need that high protein, yes or no? No, because you're no longer growing. And how much protein do you need? And which one is better? 
So the myth is that animal protein will give you a better protein than plant protein. Now how did this myth begin? In 1914, Osborne and Mendel found that rats grew better on animal protein. The word better is a misnomer. There's no such thing as better. They grew faster. Let's just call it by its name. In 1945, 10 amino acids found to be necessary for a rat's diet were discovered, and animal protein was found to guarantee normal growth in a rat. That was the message that went out to the world. If you want to grow properly, eat animal protein. Rats grow faster on animal protein. Animal proteins were then called the class A protein. And vegetable protein was called a class B protein. And that myth remains with us to this very day. Now when we look at protein comparisons of milk in different species, then we find some very interesting facts. The mean value of protein contents per milligram per liter in human milk is 1.2 milligrams per liter. And the time required to double your birth weight is 120 days. If you go to the horse, you can see that the protein in the horse's milk is exactly double of that of the human. And fascinatingly, the growth rate is exactly double. When you come to the cow, then you'll see there's an increase in the protein content and the cow grows faster than the horse. Down to the goat, even more. Down to the cat, even more. Down to the rat, very high, 11.8. And it only takes 4.5 days to double the birth weight. Now obviously, if protein is the way to go, then the best milk should be rat milk. Everybody should be using it, and prolifically. Now, why has the human being got the lowest protein content? Because what is important in human development is the development of the nervous system. When a little baby is born, does it get up and run next to the mother? No, it has to be taken care of. It cannot even move properly because the nerve connections aren't even there yet. And there are sutures so that the brain can still develop and grow. And if those should be uh, closed for some reason or another, well, then you'd have a problem. Then you would have uh, serious brain injury. So everything is geared towards cognitive development and growth is secondary. It can grow slowly. So this is food is geared for brain development but has sufficient protein for growth. But everybody wants huge babies that are oversized and heavy and cognitively challenged. Uh, let's go on. If you look at the type of diet, non-vegetarian diet, percent variance from Rose's standard. Rose's standard is a standard which determines the quality of a protein in terms of dietary necessity. Then non-vegetarian diets vary by 48%, but pure vegetarian diets only by 28%. So it's really not true that plant proteins are going to be inferior. And uh, non-vegetarian variants is actually only is 22%, and pure vegetarian only 13% variance. UK shoppers, this was a recent scare in 2015, UK shoppers give pork the chop after proceeds meats are linked to cancer. And everybody says, oh, we have to watch it, we have to get away from these processed animal foods, and everybody stopped eating it. And then a week or two or three later, what happened? Everybody went back to their original diet and The Guardian wrote an article and said food industry greets cancer links with a shrug. It's been here before, who cares, you know. Supermarkets, food suppliers already under fierce pressure over the amount of sugar in the nation's food could have done 
without more revelations about the health consequences of the food we eat, but after a lengthy investigation by its International Agency for Research on Cancer, the World Health Organization has concluded that bacon, ham and sausages are carcinogenic. Ho hum, ho hum. You don't change diets of people very readily, especially if they have perverted palates. It's very hard to move to something uh, less spicy in society. It takes, it takes effort and it takes work. Complete and incomplete protein. So people think, okay, so if animal protein is so much better, why is it so much better? And they say, well, it's a complete protein. What does that mean? It contains all the essential amino acids. And those that are incomplete, well, they contain lower levels of some of the essential amino acids. Now, what is an essential amino acid? All, all amino acids are essential. If you miss an amino acid, you're not going to do too well. You're going to be a very dead person. So you need all amino acids, all of them are essential. But some of them I have to get in my diet, and those we call essential, because it's essential that I get them in my diet, because I can't manufacture them. Others I can manufacture myself, and therefore it's not essential that I get them in the diet, because if I don't get them in the diet, I make them myself. I have the chemical pathways to make them. So this is the issue. A complete protein, therefore, contains in the diet already all essential amino acids. And animal protein contains all of them in relatively high concentrations. Whereas plant proteins don't. But combinations of plants do. So a grain will have some of them and a legume or any of the, the other plant categories will have the other. So any combination of grains and seeds or legumes will give you complete protein. Now, Again, you can see how the press can use this. Plant proteins aren't complete proteins. So we need to have animal proteins somewhere in the diet. And if you are sick, then maybe you should have eggs or this or that or the other. But with the modern knowledge, we know that that's not necessary. You must just make sure that you have the right combinations. If you're going to have a diet of white bread every single day with a high carbohydrate on top, like a, a fake jam, like the world eats, well then you're going to have a problem. You're going to have a serious problem. But if you have a simple thing like a peanut butter sandwich, you're not going to have a problem. Because it's a grain legume combination. So it's just a question of education. Now where in the world did you ever hear that people in nature would only have one kind of food? Don't people eat fruits, grains, legumes, vegetables, all kinds of foods. So the probability of developing a protein deficiency is extremely unlikely. If you take uh, Western women that have huge intakes of animal protein and high intakes of calcium, up to 1,400 milligrams per day in uh, the USA, for example, why do they have osteoporosis? Why do they have all of those diseases? And Gambian women in Africa, they take only 350 grams of protein, which is massively lower, don't have any osteoporosis. Why is that? Do people think about that? Well, plant proteins contain more branch-chain amino acids than do animal proteins, and they are easier to digest than animal proteins. Animal proteins are very tight, wound-up proteins, often in a helical form, and plant proteins are globular, and the enzymes needed to digest them uh, are much more available to them or work better. Animal proteins are rich in sulfur-containing amino acids like cysteine and methionine, and they have greater proportions of aromatic amino acids that have ring structures on them like phenylalanine and tyrosine. And excesses of these two amino acids have been associated with degenerative diseases. So amino acids look different. They all have one thing in common. There's a 
COOH group there, carboxyl group, then the first carbon, the alpha carbon, and then there is a nitrogen associated with it, an NH2 group, and that makes it an amino acid, because this is an acid, and that's the amino group. And then they all differ, like cysteine here has a sulfur attached to it, methionine has a sulfur in the molecule, and some of the others here, for example, tyrosine has a ring structure. And so they all differ, and here you have arginine, which is a very interesting one because it has all of these amino groups over there. There's one, there's one, so nitrogen is very prevalent, there's one. And so they all differ in shape and size. Now, if you get your diet largely from protein, like these people that say, we have to have a high-protein diet so we can lose weight. That's the best diet to have. Well, you don't store any protein in your body. You have to utilize the proteins that you eat on a regular basis. Your amino acid pool from one meal will stay in your, in your system for about 17 hours, and then it's gone. But you are fueled by carbohydrate. Your brain functions only on carbohydrate as its dietary source. So if I'm eating protein, then where do I get my carbohydrate from so that I can have half a brain? Where do I get it from? I have to get it from the protein. But protein and carbohydrate is very different. Carbohydrate doesn't contain any sulfur. Carbohydrate doesn't contain any amino groups. Carbohydrate doesn't contain any of these phenolic groups. So I have to take the protein I'm eating and chemically convert it. So I must split out the sulfur, I must split out the amino group, and I must split off the phenolic group. Now what are they going to do in my blood? They're going to wreak havoc. The sulfur is going to be sulfate. It's going to increase my acid, acid doses. Uh, the phenolic groups are going to be carcinogenic, floating around in my blood, and I have to get rid of these things. So how do I get rid of them? Well, I have to get rid of them in the urine, and I get rid have to get rid of them fast, or they're going to be a problem. So these are the issues, and I have to detoxify the ammonia, because otherwise I'm going to be seriously compromised. So I have to change it to urea, and then I have to get rid of that, and if I don't, I'm going to go and have serious problems. So if I have kidney failure, how long can I go without dialysis? Not very long. It'll kill me, these products. So a high-protein diet is automatically associated with high toxic levels in your blood. Whereas a high-carbohydrate diet, if I burn up the carbohydrate, the end product is carbon dioxide and water. The water is useful to me, the carbon dioxide, I go, and it's gone. And the plants say, thank you very much, and absorb it. Something else. Plant proteins produce high levels of the amino acid arginine, which had all those amino groups on it, and glycine uh, in the blood, higher than animal protein. And this is associated with protection against the clogging of arteries and arteriosclerosis. They knew that a long time ago. Why? Because the plant protein, high in arginine, kickstarts the process of taking the ammonia that comes from protein metabolism and putting it, detoxifying it straight into urea. So it's always good to remember to drink lots of water in the day to flush the urea out of the system. If you have low arginine, then the equation sits more to the other side and the ammonia stays longer, fractionally longer in the blood before it is detoxified because it has to go into the urea cycle and the urea cycle starts with arginine. So if you have high arginine to begin with, you have high detoxification to begin with. So what kind of protein do you want? You want one with high arginine and you want glycine. And the ratio of lysine to arginine could be important in determining the ability of a protein to induce arteriosclerosis. This was my big problem when I started my own research on this issue, because the funding agencies wouldn't believe this and say, excuse me, what's the difference between a protein and a protein? 
An animal protein contains amino acids. A plant protein contains amino acids. What do you mean plant proteins will protect you against disease? That's nonsense. So you first had to prove this by many, many different ways and experiments in order to get the funding to get the ball rolling at all. So this was very difficult in the early age. And then these phenols, these ring structures, have been implicated as promoters of bowel cancer. And ammonia increases cell proliferation, so that's cell colon cancer. You want to get rid of these things, quickly. So here's the summary. You want arginine and glycine in your blood to be high. And you want enough lysine to cope with whatever else your body's need is. Oh. Then the question arose, how much protein? And the idea, of course, is the more the better. And what do these, these modern people in the gyms, what is their philosophy as to how to grow abnormally? <laughs> high protein, high protein. And what is the protein that they use largely? Casein, which is dairy protein. And they have such problems with their, with their health, especially in terms of respiratory diseases, that uh, it is amazing that they haven't figured out what the problem is. So many years ago already the World Health Organization issued a directive where they said that uh, an adult, only human being, only needs 0.75 grams per kilogram body mass per day which would mean that 40 to 50 grams of protein per day for a female is ample, and 50 to 60 grams in a male is ample to supply all your needs. Now the average Westerner consumes 350 grams of protein per day. That's 300 grams more than he needs. So what's he going to do with it? He can't store it, so he's going to convert it. What's he going to convert it to? He's going to convert it to carbohydrate with all those toxins associated and he's going to have to get rid of those toxins. So about 50,000 Americans die each year of problems related to osteoporosis, dietary protein increases the production of acid in the blood, and we've already discussed this one, even if you take large amounts of calcium like the Westerners, you still have bone loss. There must be something wrong. Under controlled conditions, the level of dietary protein has profound and sustained effects on urinary calcium. Today, there are all kinds of theories to get rid of these arguments. So what's the relationship between calcium and hip fracture? Let's have a look at it. The top countries in the world, in fact, they're off the graph. They're off the charts. They're not even on the graph. They're so high. Norway and Sweden have the highest rate of hip fracture followed by Denmark, United States, New Zealand, and all of those countries. So what is the, the message to the Norwegians? I mean, I was in Norway many times lecturing, and the first thing they tell me, whatever you do, just don't tell the people to stop dairy intake. I said, why? Well, that's our diet, and we don't want to change. I said, okay, that's fine, stay sick. Norway. Why has it got the highest rate of osteoporosis? And what is the solution? More dairy. Because dairy contains calcium. That's why they're off the chart. They're not even on their chart. They're so high up. And uh, if I had to put this in perspective on a normal graph, you wouldn't even be able to see it. And already early on, they knew that a high ratio of dietary animal to vegetable protein increases bone loss, and that women are four times more liable to have this problem. Now, this was my own research, and I can only base what I believe on the literature in this regard and on my own research. Now let me tell you that the research and the literature which you consult is not what filters through to the media. What you get in the media is the hype of popular thinking. You don't get published in the newspapers, journal publications on these issues. You're getting what Joe Schmo and Joe Blow 
believes on the issue, or what the dairy industry thinks of the soy industry, or what the soy industry thinks of the dairy industry, and never this war will stop because it has financial implications. So, what does my own research reveal? I know I've, I've shared this, I'm going to share it in a little bit more detail today, to show you what we found. And it is irrefutable. And if someone wants to doubt it, they can go and check these publications. The publications are in the Journal of Medical Primatology, which is one of the top journals in, in regard to this type of research. So we worked with vervet monkeys because they apparently closely uh, are very similar to humans in terms of their metabolism. Now let me just show you something about osteoporosis. If you look at a, a vertebrae under the microscope, the electron microscope, scanning electron microscope, you'll see that a normal vertebrae looks like this. And after maceration, maceration is when you put it into a solvent that dissolves all the organic tissue. In other words, all the cellular tissue is gone, so all you're left with is the lattice work, the microarchitecture of the calcium bone structure. So there's no live cell in there. So a normal vertebrae shows a beautiful lattice work, a scaffolding of calcium upon which you stand. Now if you have an osteoporotic vertebrae and you look at it, it looks like this, and when you macerate it, it looks like that. Now if you're going to stand on a, on a scaffolding, on a high building, which one would you prefer? One that looks as solid as that or one that looks as weak as this? So obviously there's a problem here. So we're looking at microarchitecture. You cannot just look at something like density. You cannot just take a bone and measure the density. Because if you were to measure a bird bone, you would have a very low density. But you would have incredible strength. Have you seen big birds like that walk on matchsticks? Huh? And they land on them at high speed. If they were weak, what would happen to them? They should just shatter. And it doesn't happen. So bone strength is not just how dense is the bone. It's how strong is the lattice work. And that has to do with microarchitecture. And this is what often confuses the issue in the world out there. All right, so what did we do? We wanted to compare what the African nations used to eat, which was a grain legume diet. Maize and a legume. That's what they ate. And this is what has bad press in the world today, especially if that legume happens to be soy. So, here we're looking at urine production of monkeys on milk and maize legume diet. So we put them on a maize legume diet and the other one we put on a milk solid diet. Now let me put that into perspective. What these monkeys received every single day, both groups, was a certain quantity of fruit, which is their natural diet, so they had access to the same amount of fruit. Cut up for them, precisely weighed the quantities for the different groups, so they had fruits. And then they received a ball with grains in it, which is their protein component because they would eat things of similar nature in nature. And they would see this little ball, and then we would make sure that the protein content was exactly monitored. We worked at a ratio of 18% protein. And the protein that we added to what was already there was legume protein, until we brought the total in this little ball of grain, which was identical for both groups, up to 18%. And in the other group, we took exactly the same food, and instead of adding the legume to increase the protein, we added milk solids, in other words, casein, as the source of protein. That was the only difference. 
They all had their fruit. They all had their access to everything that they enjoy. They weren't just put on a strict this protein or that protein diet. And what was the result? Well, urine production increased. And more so if they had the animal protein in their little ball of grain protein combination than when they had the legume. Now that's not so insignificant by itself. Stool production, you have the same thing. There was a higher stool production, so they lost more fecal matter. All right, there could be other factors as well. But let's have a look at what actually happens per milliliter of urine, for example. If they were on maize legume, then consistently they had uh, less calcium in the urine per unit than if they had the animal protein. Okay, so in other words, they lost more calcium in the urine, but we also saw that they urinated more. So that means they lost even more. So if you take them all both together, then it was a significant loss. Now the dogma at the time was that as you increase protein consumption, you would have greater calcium loss, and that would put you into negative calcium balance, and that should produce bone mass changes. Now the first research we ever did on this was with our sheep program, where the sheep that are fed in stalls like this develop skew leg syndrome. That was the very first research program we ever did in my research laboratory on animal protein versus plant protein. And I proposed the hypothesis that the sheep were developing skew leg syndrome, in other words, weakened legs, because they were getting animal protein in their diet, which is standard practice in the world out there. Uh, in this case, they were feeding them fish meal. And so I said, if you fed them in the equivalent of plant protein, they wouldn't develop it. Of course, nobody believed it, so the only way to prove it is do the research, which we did. So we put them into five categories, and the first group received the basic protein of 12% protein, all of plant origin, and that was basically alfalfa. And that is lucerne. Okay, that contains about 12% protein, so that's what these sheep got. And the second group, we added 3% fish meal protein to it, and the next group we added 5%, and the next group we added 8%. So 12% was always from the original lucerne, alfalfa. And we only went to 20%, although the industry pushes it to 35%. So this wasn't being mean. And then, to have a double control, we took plant protein in the form of the bad press gluten, and added it to this basic diet of Lucerne to bring it up to 20%. So those were the categories. And then we found that as we increased the animal protein, so the legs got skewer. There's one with straight legs. There's one that received 5% animal protein. You can see the deformity in the feet and the skewness of the leg. And there's one that received the 8% animal protein, it's pretty devastating. But statistically, over the whole group, there was a significant difference between those that received plant protein and animal protein. Now we wanted to know what's happening in the legs. These legs are pretty deformed. Now again, just for interest's sake, this happens in stall-fed sheep. If you let that same sheep run around outside and you give it the same bad diet, it won't develop because movement also plays a, a role and you develop stronger legs if you have, you know, movement. So there are many issues involved and doing sport and being physically ac active is certainly a tremendous protective, you know, environment. But this tells you what happens at the cellular level when you cut out all of those parameters. And obviously it's not good for you, right? 
must be bad for the sheep. So we took x-rays. Do these, do these bones look uh, fractured? Are they seriously compromised under x-ray uh, criteria? Answer, no. They actually look okay. They just skew. Why? Because they're weak. Because the animal grows quickly, because that's what they want, and the weight is too great for the leg, the strength doesn't develop, so it just buckles. And the same happens in all animals that are fed like that. And when you look at little babies that are fed at high protein diets of an animal protein nature, you often see that they have these bowed legs. And when they start running around a lot and the exercise kicks in, well, then it improves. But it's obviously a problem. So here are our beautiful sheep, some with straight legs, some with terrible legs, like this one. This is just an example from the whole group. We looked at the calcium to phosphorus ratio in the bone and found whether we use the cannon bone, whether we use the rib, or whether we use the vertebra, we found that the ratio of calcium to phosphorus actually declines in the bone. So that means the way in which the bone is built up of calcium and phosphorus differs. Now, phosphorus actually makes the bone quite dense. So if calcium gets lower and phosphorus gets higher, you could actually get quite a high density and still have a weak bone. So it's not always true that density will tell you what's going on in a bone. So that was quite fascinating. If we looked at calcium loss, total calcium loss in the urine and the stool, milligrams per day, then those that received this is now the highest group. They received 8% animal protein and the other one 8% plant protein added, bringing the total to 20% in both. You'll see that those that received animal protein had more than double the calcium loss to those that received plant protein. Uh, when you looked at deformity, those that received the plant protein had very low deformity. Remember, 50% is zero problem because you're working from both sides of the normal divide. Your legs could buckle this way or they could buckle this way. So the lowest deformity was in the plant protein and the highest was in the animal protein. And this one was fascinating. This is calcium to phosphorus ratio. And you see that the animal protein actually had less calcium relative to phosphorus than the plant protein. So you cannot argue the fact that the animal protein caused calcium loss. This doesn't mean that the bone will be weak, because if you have uh, enough calcium, there might be enough going in the bone. So there's a lot of factors involved here. This one, of course, totally flawed us. Totally unexpected. The bone mineral density of those that received the animal protein was actually higher than those that received the plant protein. That's contrary to everything that the Western world believes. And uh, why? We had to look further. And so we looked at the actual bone formation. And then you look at issues like osteoid volume, osteoid surface. These are microscopic investigations where you, with the microscope, measure certain parameters in the bone. We don't have to go into the details. And then you put it into a statistical package and you work out exactly what the structure of the bone is like. And consistently, this is amazing, the graphs have this kind of structure. This kind of structure. Now, you look at the volume, Relative osteoid volume, this one over here, was the 12% all plant-based diet. So they got lucerne, alfalfa. And then if you added the 3, the 5, the 8% animal protein, histologically, the bone was being compromised. So it got worse and worse. If you added plant protein in the form of gluten, perfect improvement. That proves beyond the shadow of doubt that the problem lies in the animal protein and not just any other factor. If you looked at the osteoid surface, exactly the same thing. Now, you know, people will say, 
Well, perhaps over this long period of six months that it took place, this experiment, you know, maybe you're just taking a sample here and a sample there, and maybe this, you know, you get all kinds of counter arguments. So we decided we're going to look at exactly 10 days growth to minimize all other environmental factors. And the way you do that is you inject something that actually marks the bone. And uh, tetracycline, if you inject that into the animals, just an amino acid, actually puts a label in the bone that you can see under the microscope under fluorescent light. And then 10 days later, we'd give the same injection, and in between you would have exactly 10 days growth. So that cuts out any environmental factor, and every animal you're looking at the exact same time, 10 days growth. And, I mean, this is magnificent. 12% plant protein, perfect bone structure. When you go to plus 3% animal protein, worse. 5% even worse. 8% disastrous. Add 8% gluten, even improves over the 12%. So, plant protein does what? Improves the microarchitecture of your bone. That's what it does. Gives you a stronger bone. Bottom line, take it or leave it. Primate union, unit. What about the other parameters? Not just the bone parameters. What about cardiovascular disease? Well, the current theory is that milk is implicated in high cholesterol levels. LDH must is normally high, that's your bad cholesterol. HDL should be low, etc., etc. So let's have a look at these same monkeys, and you can see these are highly significant differences. If you looked at the diet that was associated with the dairy protein as opposed to the uh, legume, then what you find, and yes, the legume that we used over here was the common kidney bean that is eaten by the African nation, largely. Then you find exactly the same thing. Total cholesterol was always higher in those that received the animal protein. Always. Statistically higher. All right, which one was it? LDL? Again, you see that the Western diet consistently gives you a higher LDL level, which is bad pro uh, cholesterol. If you look at the ratio HDL-LDL, do you want HDL to be high relative to LDL? Consistently, you had the same thing. The maize legume gave you consistently the better ratio. All right. Now the proof of the pudding, as they say, is always in the eating. Now these experiments ran over a six-month period. In other words, you're taking monkeys that are all on exactly the same diet, and then you're putting them in the group, and then over a six-month period, you are measuring what is happening. And uh, at the end of the process, this is what this is exactly the same portion of the main artery in the body, the aorta, the main artery. This is the one that received the maize legume diet. It's a squeaky clean artery. They are this little side blood vessels. They are absolutely beautiful. They're open, no clogging whatsoever. After just a few weeks upon this diet, this is what the others looked like that received the dairy. Look at that cholesterol deposit. Look at those blood vessels totally clogged. It's a total disaster. Would you want vessels like that? So beyond a shadow of doubt, your cardiovascular system is compromised. Okay, let's make sure. Let's have a look at it histologically. Here is uh, the monkeys that received the uh, grain legume diet. No cholesterol deposit. There you can see the muscular tissue. Perfect elastic blood vessels. Look at that cholesterol deposition in those that received the dairy. Horrendous. But even worse, we found these structures in the blood vessel, in the walls of the blood vessels. And when we analyzed them, we found that they were calcium. In other words, there was so much calcium loss, it couldn't, the kidneys couldn't cope with it. And so they deposited it in the blood vessels. And this makes the blood vessel brittle. And, uh, well, that leads to 
blood pressure increases, risks of uh, aneurysms, etc., strokes increase. What about uh, immune system? What about the lymphocyte count? This is very important today in research when it comes to AIDS. How active is your immune system? And invariably again, the diet of grain legume gave you far better immunocapacity than when you were on the other diet. Platelet count, exactly the same thing. Red blood cell count, if they were on the Western diet, they had higher concentrations of red blood cells. Now, isn't that a good thing? Whereas here they had lower ones. Now the red blood cells were far more if they received the Western diet. And you ask yourself the question, why? Why? Now if you have a high fat content like dairy, then the red blood corpuscles tend to stick together. Now imagine that my hand is the surface of the red blood corpuscle. It has two surfaces, right? And that's where your oxygen exchange takes place. Now here's another one. If I put them together, what have I done to the surfaces? I've reduced them by half. So how do I get more oxygen? Well, I have to increase the number of red blood cells to get more oxygen. But what does that do? It makes it harder for the blood to pump through the capillaries because they are larger than the capillary. The capillary actually has to expand to let it through. So I have to push more solids larger than the capillary through the blood vessel, you're going to have a problem. So is this a good thing or is it a bad thing that there are more red blood corpuscles? If they're nice and separate, as in this case, you're getting all the oxygen you need and you're getting easy flow through your capillaries. So even that is compromised. All right, so some people started saying to us, excuse me, we all know that sheep and monkeys are vegetarians. So you're being compromised on this issue. What about some other animals? So we repeated it. We repeated it on rabbits. We repeated it on rodents. And we repeated it on canines. So that you have the whole spectrum. Now I'm not going to show all the researchers, but what happened when we did the same to a rabbit? Exactly the same. In this case now, we decided to switch to soy. And by the way, in those days, in our early research, the GMO question was not really there, so this was probably largely contaminated GMO soy. But what was the result? Arginine levels? Well, 18%, so we gave the same amount of protein. When they had soy, the arginine levels were considerably higher than when they received the, de the casein as their protein source. When we looked at glycine, soy gave the higher glycine levels than the milk solids. So that's the ones that you want. Now where do you find arginine in the foods? Black walnuts, half a cup will give you 2.3 grams. Baby lima beans will give you 2.4 grams per cup. Red kidney beans will give you 2.6. Gabanzo beans, 3.6, lentils, 4.2, soybeans, 5.3, pumpkins, 6.2. You want to have those seeds in your diet. These are foods that will give it to you. And uh, if you look at the pH, in other words, the acidity, you'll see that as soon as we gave the animal protein, the urine was more acid, showing that it produces an acid system. Okay. This is the fecal wet mass. When these uh, rabbits received casein, they had dry fecal pellets. When they received soy, they had wet fecal pellets. In other words, they were, it was easier to pass the stool. And when you look at that calcium, it's the same thing. Soy, casein increased the calcium loss. Soy reduced it. Uh, urinary calcium, casein increased it, soy reduced it. Highly significant differences. So, urine production again, or urea production, casein, much higher than soy. In other words, you had to metabolize more protein and change it to what you needed it. 
and you were compromised in terms of your health. And the science of the time even said that rabbits fed animal proteins develop arteriosclerosis. And we showed that that was exactly the case. And the science said that animal protein increases cholesterol levels. And therefore, that there are long-term health implications. So, let's have a look at that. Soy cholesterol levels were considerably lower than when you gave them milk solids. And uh, vegetable protein promotes lower cholesterol in rabbits. That was common knowledge already. But there are so many factors that play a role here that, uh, you know, it's movement, it's exercise, all of these issues. And this is a very interesting graph because this is the 10 animal proteins that cause high cholesterol in rabbits. Egg yolk causes the highest. Skim milk protein, second highest. Turkey, casein. Whole egg protein, fish, beef, chicken, pork, raw egg white, and plant protein. And I always found this rather fascinating because as soon as you have high cholesterol, what does the medical world tell you to take? Switch to skim milk. Now look at that. It's the second highest cholesterol elevating protein that there is. So it's not the cholesterol that is the problem, it's the protein that is the problem. Because the, the vessels have to protect themselves against the consequences of protein metabolism and then the result is the problems that you have associated with it. These are the 10 plant proteins that cause low cholesterol. There's the average animal protein. So rapeseed flour, wheat gluten, peanut protein. So just in terms of cholesterol, what's worse? Gluten or animal protein? Animal protein. And uh, then we come to the beans, like the soybeans. I mean, these are really cholesterol lowering. And it is actually found that if people have high cholesterol, taking a teaspoon of beans, even something as simple as baked beans, every day, as though it were medication, you are actually simulating what the medical world will give you as cholesterol lowering drugs. Just take a legume. We're designed for that kind of thing. And uh, many of the fears will disappear when we cut out this red category, then none of the green category will be a problem. Milk and infertility. Even in the early 90s, they started saying, maybe Western society has so many fertility problems because of dairy consumption. And of course, the world freaked again and said that is not the case. And uh, being an opportunist and having the program running already, I decided, well, let's check out what the result is on our monkeys. And they happen to be male monkeys, so you want to cut out the difference between male and female. So we had them all male. And what was the result? This is what a good, healthy sperm cell looks like. And we wanted to see whether it is true that, uh, you know, you are compromised when you are on a vegetarian diet in terms of your sexuality. And uh, here we can see that testosterone levels on the traditional diet, this is the baseline, so you can't go with that. In actual fact, on the baseline, you're taking from the research monkeys out of the normal group, and they are in a diet that contains animal protein already. So when you're bringing them in and you're changing the diet, you have a progressive change over time. And this was after 50 days. You can see a complete reversal over here. Traditional diet didn't compromise testosterone level at all. In other words, the males that received grain legume were just as frisky or more so than the others. When it came to progressive motility, this is rather interesting, because uh, let me explain this a little one. I haven't done this in detail before. I'll do it in a little bit more detail now. We actually ran this experiment for a month, and then we switched from a high-protein to a low-protein diet. 
what we called high protein wasn't really high protein. It was the 18% protein diet. And then we switched it down to a 12% protein diet for the next month to see what would happen. And it's fascinating. The baseline, there wasn't much difference. After 60 days on the grain legume diet, the progressive motility, in other words, the, way, the speed at which sperm can swim, was increased if they were on the grain legume diet over the milk diet. So it actually improved on the vegetarian diet. But when we lowered the protein content to 12%, which is enough for the animal's needs, look at that, the difference became highly significant. In other words, it even improved. And the, sp the sperm at the lower protein exposure was far more active and vibrant than otherwise. So any high protein will compromise you. If you come closer to what you really need, you will have improved uh, conditions. So that was rather fascinating. So if you have enough protein, but not too high protein, that's probably your best shot. Sperm concentration, you can see that uh, st statistically it didn't differ after 60 days when they were on the high protein diet. Although the grain legumes seemed to be a little bit higher, but it's not significant. But as soon as we lowered the protein content to what is more appropriate, then the difference was very marked. And the concentration increased dramatically. Fascinating compared to the other group. Then also abnormalities, how the sperm develops. Normal sperm, mid-piece defect, tail defect. Now this was all published in the Journal of Medical Primatology and these graphs are taken directly from there. Sperm head defects, uh, over here, no difference after 60 days. But as soon as you went on the animal protein diet after 120 days, there was a marked difference. The defects were greater in the animal protein group. When it comes to the mid-piece defects, exactly the same thing. You can see the difference. The animal protein group was compromised. So what kind of diet does my own research tell me is the best kind of diet? Plant protein, no matter which way you look at it. And uh, which combination would give me the best parameters, whether we tested normal legumes or whether we tested soy, the result was the same. Whether we used a monkey, whether we used a sheep, whether we used a, a canine, whether we used uh, a rat, whether we used a rabbit, it never ever changed. Now this is very surprising. What does the scripture say was the original diet of all animals on the planet? Plants, plant-based diet. And therefore I found it fascinating that whether you are a cat or whether you are a dog or whether you are a pig or whether you are a sheep or whether you are a whatever, the metabolism is exactly the same. You're better off on the plant protein than on the animal protein. And, and in Africa, we have all these wonderful carnivores, you know, like the lions and all of these wonderful creatures. And there have been so many occasions where these lions in captivity were for some reason or other placed on vegetarian diets. In other words, grain legume diets. So they received maize porridge and legumes and those kinds of things for their diets. And there are famous stories of such lions, pet lions. And the one belonged to a man who lived into his 90s and he put his lion on a vegetarian diet because he was his pet and he slept next to him but he couldn't stand the smell which emanated from the skin and occasionally wafted from the rear end as well. And so he put him on a vegetarian diet and that solved that problem. But he was so surprised that all the skin diseases, the eczema and all of these things also disappeared and this lion lived twice as long as any of his other pet lions that were not his favorite pet lying on his bed next to him. And then there are the famous stories of the Hollywood lion. 
that was totally vegetarian and was used in all the early Hollywood films. And uh, it was such a gentle lion and was popular. And they had all these movies, you know, of the lion and all of these things. And he was such a tame animal. And the first time they gave him meat, he died. So in other words, what I'm saying is if you have a variety in your diet of all the vegetables that you can think of and uh, all of these wonderful things, which are not only, you know, something for the palate, they're also something for the eye, and you have the various grains and all the, you know, the, the great varieties that we have and you keep mixing them. And I find it interesting that if you have only one grain in your life, then you can be challenged in terms of your protein composition. If you add two, it's better. And if you have three grains, then uh, you have all the amino acids that you need. The combination of three grains will give you them all. Any one grain, together with any one legume, will give you perfect protein. So it's not true that plant protein is inferior. It is incredibly superior. So any combination of these, and there, we must start learning to utilize different things. Mankind is so used to being either wheat orientated or rice orientated. And if you look at the, the Bible, even when there were plagues, the harvest that was always protected was the barley harvest, the wheat harvest, and the rye harvest because those were basic foods. And if you read the stories of the Bible, from Boaz all the way through the stories that Jesus used, you'll see that the wheat harvest, the barley harvest, and all of these harvests are prominent in these stories. Today, these are the foods that you must avoid because they cause problems. No, they only cause problems if they're eaten in conjunction with animal protein. And we're always throwing the baby out instead of the dirty bath water. Fruit. Should we consume fruit? Fruit is rich in carbohydrates. Some people say fruit should therefore not be consumed. We need more protein foods. We're, we don't need more protein foods. Even a growing child doesn't need that high protein. One gram of protein per kilogram body mass is sufficient. And... Uh, any diet which contains a grain and a legume will provide that for any growing kid. And uh, fruit is rich in carbohydrate, but it's rich in soluble fiber, and it's rich in non-soluble fiber. It is the absolute perfect energy food which cannot possibly make you fat. And if we look at the beautiful varieties out there in the world, Surely there's an abundance to choose from, from everything that pleases the eye and provides what is necessary. And I believe that the diet that we find originally in the Bible and the diet that will be in the future, because the Bible says that the lion will eat the same kind of food as the other animals, like the ox, for example, they all go back to that kind of diet. And my own research has shown, beyond the shadow of doubt, that legumes, whether they are soy or whether they are not, definitely prove that all blood parameters are improved and structural parameters are improved if you stick to the plant-based protein. And for me, that is conclusive. And I hope for the listener as well. Thank you. Thank you.